doctors are still unsure why some people have no symptoms and others are hospitalized. Now, neuroscientists are raising questions about the virus's impact on the brain. A new Reuters article takes a look at a study from University College London. Researchers examined 43 COVID-19 cases where patients suffered either temporary brain dysfunction, strokes, nerve damage, or other serious brain effects. For more on this, a joint author of that study, Dr. Hadi Manji, joins me. He is a consultant neurologist and senior lecturer at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Dr. Manji, welcome. So great to have you with us. Can you tell us more about the kinds of effects this disease is having on some patients' brains? So our study found that there were four categories of neurological complications. One was a group of patients who had delirium, by which we mean confusion or disorientation. And this may be due to multiple factors, such as low oxygen levels or low blood pressure, or it could be the virus. It's not clear what the cause is. But this group of patients generally recovered spontaneously without any treatment. The second group was those who had inflammation in a very broad sense. And these were seriously ill patients with coma, with weakness, with headaches. And these, again, were treatable conditions, but the outcome was variable depending on the severity. As you mentioned, strokes. Now, some of these patients will be elderly with stroke risk factors, such as diabetes or high blood pressure or regular heartbeats, but about half had no vascular risk factors. And it seems that in COVID-19, the blood is stickier than normal. And it's, there is evidence that the lining of blood vessels is in, infected by the virus. So you have a double whammy risk for having strokes. And the final group of patients with weakness in the arms and legs, and you may have heard of this syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which we've seen after infections, where patients develop paralysis, and it's where a number of cases related to COVID-19 and this particular syndrome. And these problems that you discovered, these, these you know, adverse brain effects, does it appear as if these are something that these patients will eventually overcome, or are these permanent? So I would emphasize that the numbers were small, and the group was very highly selected of inpatients in hospital. Now, as I've said, some of these patients will be left with residual disabilities from stroke or brain damage. The delirium patients generally did well. The last group, again, variable numbers would get better, but some of them did not, so the outcome can be devastating. Wow, some did not recover. So, doctor, you know, when we first learned about the virus, it was all about the lungs. Then GI symptoms were added to the list, followed by the heart and now the brain. So are you seeing these effects only in the sickest patients or does there appear to be, you know, some genetic predisposition uh, to this so that patients who don't necessarily get so sick will still have these long-term negative effects, possibly? No, that's a very valid point. Some of our patients had minimal or very banal chest symptoms. And one of the messages we wanted to put out was for physicians to be aware of these neurological complications, which may precede the development of respiratory symptoms. So uh, the answer to your question that they didn't always have bad chests uh, in terms of the um, underlying cause. And, and you're right, why do some patients get so badly affected? It may be because of the viral load, depending how they're infected, but it could be there are genetic factors which predispose some patients more than others. There's so much we still don't know about this virus. And as you pointed out, this is a small study. But can you sort of extrapolate, if you can look at the millions of people around the world who have been infected with COVID-19 at this point, you know, can we speculate that at least a certain percentage of them might have these long-term brain disabilities? Well, I think there are two groups of patients. One who were admitted to hospital and have become very seriously ill. So these are the ones that we dealt with. And the numbers are very small in that. But then there's a whole group of patients who were never admitted to hospital with COVID-19 symptoms. And these patients seem to have what are described as post-viral symptoms, which may go on for a long time. And a lot of patients were affected with fatigue, brain fog, uh, pins and needles, and muscle pains. And this is going to be the huge group I think, which will require assessment and, and uh, management in the long term, in terms of numbers. 
And so what is the most concerning to you about these results? What are you most curious about finding out in your further research? The question is, what is the mechanism of, say, the brain inflammation? And there is some evidence that the virus doesn't seem to get into the brain. So our studies on the spinal fluid hasn't shown evidence of the virus within the, the brain. And it's the actual immune system which becomes uh, hyperimmune, and the damage is being done by the hyperstimulated immune, immune system. And I think the importance of working out the mechanisms is that we do have ways of treating a hyperinflated immune system. So the earlier we diagnose patients, the quicker they can be started on, on these uh, treatments uh, for a better recovery and outcome. So that goes back to testing again, testing, testing, testing. If, if, if early diagnosis is key, then we need to know who has this even before they have symptoms, correct? And then also have a very low threshold for investigating patients. So one of the practicalities is that in patients in intensive care units, doing an MRI scan can be very difficult because not all hospitals have facilities. And then moving patients from the intensive care unit to the MRI unit, there are all the logistics of cross-contamination, which raises huge practical uh, problems for, for, for doctors in, in hospitals. Well, Dr. Hadi Manji, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise in this virus, this mysterious virus that still has so many, there's still so much we need to learn about it. So thank you so much for sharing your research. Thank you very much.